Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to another edition of Live from Cleveland at Home today. We had a very busy week. Last night you got a chance to see the band No Ice perform live on our show. You can listen to that performance tonight live on the radio from 10 to 11 p.m. We're going to rebroadcast that performance. But right now we are joined by Dave Polster and Clint Holly from the Ernest Tube in, uh, well, Dave's, or Dave's in Cleveland. Currently, yeah. <laughs> and Clint's in Bristol, Virginia, where the Ernest Tube is located. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Tell me a little bit about how you guys met one another and first started collaborating together on different projects. Well, the first business um, that I started that was involved in vinyl uh, or disc cutting was uh, called Well. It's called Well Made Music, and we master uh, records for the vinyl reproduction industry. And um, I got into it not knowing really how busy things were going to get. And um, about three years into it, I was looking for another employee, and Dave uh, sent his. Uh, resume along and just he kind of cold called me and um we ended up hitting it off and um you know he showed up uh on time for his first uh interview and that always makes a big impression on me and uh, <laughs> I, I try i try <laughs> and I try. and we've been we've been doing this ever since and um you know the the idea of disc cutting um we're, we both have recording backgrounds so disc cutting and recording go hand in hand back to about 1950 and the Ernest Tube, uh, you know, has a historical background that we can circle back around to. And, uh, you know, Dave can tell you a little more about, you know, what we've been up to for the last, uh, you know, six years. Yeah. Uh, Clint and I, uh, I used to work at Gotta Groove Records, the, ma the record manufacturing plant here in Cleveland. Um, and that's kind of where I started getting more familiar with the format. And then I, I found out that there was an opening at Well Made. And, uh, and yeah, the rest is history. And I don't want to talk too, too much about well-made music, but you, you're you kind of like the right-hand man, the kind of right hand to the Gotta Groove. You do a lot of their mastering for vinyl, correct? Well-made yes. does, yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. Um, so so that was like the original relationship. So always right. doing mastering for vinyl and, you know, and, and listening to the quality of sound there. So the Ernest Tube is kind of really special. Clint, could you tell me a little bit about what you do for like a layperson who has never heard of you guys before what was like the original mission um behind starting this part of the, the company sure yeah uh i'm a huge country music fan and bristol virginia slash tennessee is called the birthplace of country music because in 1927 um a guy named ralph peer who worked for the victor talking machine company um had this brainstorm that um people in rural areas would buy music made by their peers. And so he started to do uh, sessions all across the South. And his most famous session was in Bristol in 1927 because he recorded the first sides by the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers, who went on to really become the first two superstars of country music. Um, there was obviously country music before 1927, but they were the ones that really kind of broke through to the uh, general public, especially the Carter family. Um, their music still resounds with people almost 100 years later. Um, so I had been traveling the area for about 20 years and decided that, you know, opening a studio like this would be uh, a good idea. So all music before 1950 was recorded directly to a disc. There were no tape recorders. So basically you take what looks like an oversized turntable and a blank disc, and you actually cut the grooves directly into that disc while the person is singing and playing. And it's a very organic experience. It's a very, um, uh, you make a mistake, you stop and you start over. Um, so, it, and it lends a different sound to the music, whether you're playing modern today or trying to recreate something that sounds like it's from the past. Um, we cut you directly to that disc and you can take that disc home and play it on a turntable. So in a way, it's a little bit magical. And is that... Um that vinyl recording able to be reproduced or is that the only copy of the one record itself? The discs that we produce are cut on, on a lacquer disc, which is a, an aluminum disc that's coated with a nitrocellulose lacquer, which is very much like nail polish. And so um, those could be plated and made into stampers, which you could press a record from. Yes. Okay, cool. So, 
So if a band wants to come down or an artist wants to come down and record with you, that's what they're going to get at the end of the session is that lacquer and then their uh, digital file, correct? Yeah. That's true. I'll let Dave handle that uh, that <laughs> end of it. Yeah, so generally for everybody who records at the Ernest Tube, we, we on the spot um, will transcribe the disc at a high sample rate and do it into the digital world just so if you did want to upload it to like Bandcamp or make a video out of it, etc., anything, um, you have that flexibility. Um, we also record straight off of our recording console as well simultaneously because things can get cantankerous with the, the lathe every once in a while and we, we would hate for somebody to lose a take that they were super happy with. So we just kind of run that as a backup, but we also supply them with those files ultimately too. So this is kind of like I've seen, you know, the Johnny Cash biopic or, mm -hmm. you know, early like Elvis Presley movie, you know, movies and stuff. And even thinking about all of the artists that were bluegrass artists that probably did a very similar thing recording straight to discs. I mean, is this this is the historical process. Absolutely. Uh, pretty much any music that you hear that was uh, made before 1950, um, you know, tape machines uh, were technology that we captured from the Germans during World War II. And uh, so the first company that made a commercially available tape machine was called Ampex. And they were, those machines came out about 1947. And of course, just like anything else, they were very expensive and very um, elite at the time. People like Bing Crosby had a tape machine. Les Paul had a tape machine. But, you know, the studios in the hinterlands of, say, Louisiana, they might not have seen a tape machine for the next, like, 10 years after that. So, um, yeah, when you talk about bluegrass music, um, Sam Phillips, when he started Sun Records, uh, started with disc recording, but he transitioned to tape um, right before uh, his most famous people like Elvis and Johnny Cash. Um, but then he sent those tapes out to be uh, cut onto lacquers and pressed into 78 RPM and, um, you know, 7-inch 45 records. Very interesting. So the equipment that you have, is this historical equipment or is this reproduction equipment to capture what um, they would have been doing at the time? Like, I'm not sure what that distinction looks like for you. And it does sound like you're, you know, doing things the way that we would do them now as well as you're simultaneously kind of doing it in this historical mm -hmm. way. So kind of talk to me a little bit about, yeah, how do you, how you figured out how to put those two pieces together to, to really have um, an experience that's not only historically relevant, but also, you know, now that you could also use it. That's a great question. And I'll, I'll take the first part of it. And I'll hand off the, the modern technology part to Dave. You know, when we described the Ernest Tube in our mission statement, we said we want to capture the essence of the 1927 uh, Bristol while adding a modern perspective. And so the gear that we use um, currently is, is old gear. They haven't really made disc cutting lathes, um, especially from the higher levels, of, like since the 1980s. So everything pretty much that you find out there on the market is is old. Um, the Reco Cut lathe that we use for the most part, Reco Cut Breen, the brand of lathe, um, was probably made in about the 1940s because it has the option for uh, 45 RPM on it, which was the last of the um, three speeds, you know, 78, 33, and 45. It was the last one that became commercially popular. So you can kind of date the machines by what speeds they have on them. If it's 78 and 33 only, it dates it as an older machine. Um, and as Dave alluded to, also, we split that signal that's going to go to that machine to the digital realm. And I'll let Dave tell you a little bit about the modern equipment that we use. Um, yeah, in terms of the modern equipment, we're, we're using a Pro Tools rig, essentially, just to capture capture the the signal but we also use we have a we're lucky to have a, a large collection of vintage microphones and things like that that also are crucial to imparting like a more older sounding uh sound so so luckily that combo lets us kind of get the best of both worlds and and make things social media friendly but also but also sound correct essentially to the period and so did was this kind of like a happy accident? Did you find this repro lathe and say, "Okay, now we're gonna do this," or was it like the opposite way, where Kinda. we have an idea to do? <laughs> yeah, we have this idea first, and let's and work. Like, yeah, did you work backwards or? 
Well, the the Ernest Tube was inspired by the disc cutting that we do at Well Made Music, and that's kind of a solitary experience for us. Like we sit in a small room and we work on these things by ourselves all day long, and we both have a recording background, and we wanted to be back in the studio with musicians. So um, our disc cutting experience kind of led it led us to that idea initially. Now the lathe that you're talking about was kind of a happy accident. Um, Dave, myself, and my wife Bonnie. All drove to, um, well, where was that? It was like out by was, Virginia Beach. I was about to say near somewhere. Virginia Beach area. Was, yeah, the guy told us he was by Baltimore, and then it, just, then it ended up being like three hours past Baltimore. It's not Baltimore. But it's a whole nother, yeah, whole nother story. But um, we actually went to go visit this guy to buy a microphone, and while we were standing in his living room, he said, oh, hey, by the way, I have this um, you know, old cutting lathe from the 40s. Do you guys want to take a look at it? Now, my wife, she's the smart one and she always tells me to take yes. extra money <laughs> and i had a lot of extra cash with me and when he told us the price me and dave looked at each other and we were like okay yeah. and we we walked out of the house and bonnie was sitting in the car because she didn't want to go hear a bunch of nerds like talking about recording gear and then we came out we were holding that and she's like oh yeah would you uh you know would you buy there and you know so uh, taking extra money was a, actually a happy accident and that machine has become our uh, go-to machine because it's a uh, very portable like you can fold yeah. it up it's like a little suitcase um you know uh on a historic aside um people who are into folk music um know the name john and alan lomax who were big um you know song collectors in the early part of the 20th century before tape machines came around, they lugged around these machines and hooked them up to the batteries of their car and uh, would sit on people's front porches and collect folk songs. And the Library of Congress, which Dave has actually seen uh, some of these discs, um, they still have these discs that were recorded back in the 30s and the 40s. It's like, it's the perfect um, amalgamation of everything I love. Like, it's a little American Pickers, but also audio <laughs> engineering oh, <yeah. laughs> right. tech stuff. So you really you really have to kind of feel that, that way. And on that note, I mean, when you got to this guy's house, you saw what he had. Was there any hesitation on your part? Like, is this gonna is this gonna work? <laughs> or if we ever need to get this repaired, are we gonna even be able to find anybody, you know, besides ourselves who can work on this? Sure. Yeah. Well, luckily, there's a pretty robust community of people that like um, deal with these machines. There's a and, and with the resurgence of vinyl records, uh, people are more interested in these things now than they were, say, fifteen or twenty years ago. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I choked up there for a second. Okay. Um, get get but, emotional talking about it. Right. <laughs> Tell me the question again, because now I just forgot the question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, well, I, my question was, you know, yeah, are, is there a community of people who could Oh, yeah, yeah. Things? And I have a real strong mechanical background, and the amazing thing about these machines is, like, there's really only one electronic part on the entire machine, and that's the little cutter head that actually um, is like uh, very much like a speaker. It's a transducer that changes an electrical signal into vibration. And so um, from a mechanical standpoint, I, I'm not scared of those th things at all. Yeah. But like, as Dave can tell you, you know, the microphones and stuff like that, you know, you have to find a professional to work on stuff like that. Right. Yeah, and, and another thing, I do not have a mechanical background at all, so Clint is a godsend in that sense, because I, <laughs> I handle the mics, that's all I got. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's going on with the machine. Like, I do now, especially mm -hmm. with well-made experience, but yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so Clint's the you, maestro. You guys get this, um, this lathe, and it's extremely portable, and then what, what happens next? I know you guys did some pretty like extensive traveling too with this thing. Yeah, we, we did. <laughs> we, we have. I mean, I'm lucky that I work with a. Uh, I'm on the board of a local nonprofit called Roots of American Music, and uh, when I joined the board, they were looking for ideas to kind of expand uh, their range and and uh, how they connected with the community. And I suggested podcasting. Uh, just kind of as a joke and <laughs> the next thing i know we had an eight thousand dollar grant to um like go to historic places and record people inside these places and then tell the story of the places through interviews and the songs that people recorded and that's how we met um um well we didn't we didn't we knew amethyst kia before 
we recorded her, but we did an amazing story on a town called Ripley, Ohio, which was an abolitionist stronghold uh, prior to the Civil War, and um, a, a guy named John Rankin who helped thousands of people um, get to freedom uh, before the Civil War, and um, it was a very powerful day. We loaded, we had a whole minivan full of stuff, and we went down to this small town, and the reaction from the town, because there's a live performance element to this too, we recorded Amethyst in, in this room, and then they allowed people to come in, and she gave a performance, and uh, the room was packed. There was people out in the hallway, and it was just really powerful to uh, hear the stories uh, from that city, and then to be able to record her and then to then piece it all together into this podcast, it was really amazing. And um, so the traveling that we've done has been revolved mostly around the podcast. Um, but we did some great Cleveland locations also. We recorded at 78th Street Studios where R. Crumb used to work. Um, we H Hotes Cafe. We did one at Hotes Cafe celebrate their 100th anniversary. Um, we did uh, About, where else? Uh, terrestrial Brewing. Terrestrial Brewing, because boxer Johnny Kilbane lived in that neighborhood, and then we recorded at a Frank Lloyd Wright house out in oh, Willoughby, yeah. Ohio, <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's a Frank Lloyd Wright house, right, and you, right. you don't often get to record in a place like that, and so, um, yeah, it's been a cool experience being able to travel and do that. It's amazing. Where can people go um, to listen to that podcast or watch, watch the performances that you were able to do? Uh, Roots of American Music homepage, uh, uh, Rome homepage. Uh, their website is uh, www.rootsofamericanmusic.org. All the podcasts are archived there. And then they also have a um, Facebook page. I'm not sure all of the recent live streams that we've done are on there. But, yeah, you can find a wealth of information on their uh, website. All three seasons of the podcast are on, uh, on their uh, page. And so... Not to today, but when we do play this uh, recording on the radio, this interview back, we are going to uh, put in some songs from the Ernest Tube uh, recordings. One of those songs we will hear is that Amethyst Kia song uh, from the recording in Ripley, Ohio. But have you worked with her since then as well? We haven't gotten the opportunity. Um, the interesting thing was... When Rome hired her, she signed her major label deal like two weeks after. So uh, <laughs> interest, it, interesting enough, though, some of the people that work with her are from Cleveland, Ohio. A guy named Jason Linder um, used to work at Telarc over on the east side. They were absorbed by a company called Concord Music Group. And now he works for their division, uh, Rounder Records, which is their you know folk imprint and Rounder being the famous label from Boston, and, and Amethyst is on that label. So there has been some talk about getting her back to the Ernest Tube and uh, doing some recording, which we would be very excited about. Well, and one of the funny things about Amethyst, too, is we first came across her uh, because we work for Well Made with a company called Soul Step Records. This is a, an independent record label, and they put out uh, her EP, which is called Chest of Glass, and we were fortunate enough to cut the masters for that. And we noticed in the in the Dead Wax in the Matrix where you scribe the the info, it said Johnson City Gem. That was what what the inscription was, and we were like, "Huh, isn't that near Bristol? That's kind of weird." And then we looked into it, and we we found out that she was from from that area, and it all kind of went from there. That was several years before uh, the the recording session. And then we saw her in a bar in Bristol, and we I think we scared her because yeah, we're we like, oh, my God, we're, we're big yeah. fans. And she's, like, just trying to sit there drinking with her girlfriend, and, like, we're like, oh, my God. She's like, oh, who the hell are these big yeah. furry, furry guys that are, like, you know, accosting me? Big but hairy, yeah. hairy plaid dudes. <laughs> she's, she's a very sweet person, and her, her, uh, her success is very well deserved. Mm -hmm. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing everything that she does in, in the future. For sure. So, okay, we talked a lot about the uh, podcast and traveling, specifically to produce the podcast, but you also decided to get a location in Bristol in order to have the Ernest Tube kind of have a home there as well. So Dave is at Well Made Music right now in Cleveland in the 78th Street Studios building, mm -hmm. but Clint, you are in Virginia at the Ernest Tube. So tell me a little bit about trying to um, 
get that recording studio together down there and like w- what kind of purpose it serves within that community. How much time do you have? <laughs> I know, I know. So, <laughs> I'm so, so interested. You go oh, for no, as long as you want. No, thank you. Um, so um, uh, I've been looking for a, a way to connect myself more to the history of country music for quite a while. And I had often thought that like I wanted to live in a place like Asheville, North Carolina, just because of the physical beauty of the place and the more temperate uh, climate, which I, you guys are not experiencing temperate today, I, I assume. No. Uh, <laughs> not, a, not at all. Like, yeah, yes. thanks. Yeah. So my first, my first trip to Asheville, North Carolina was actually almost uh, 20 years ago when um, I worked at the Beachland Ballroom um, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, Bim Thomas, um, he's in a band called the the Bass Holes, and and um, his cohort Don Holland was from the South, and they got a string of opening dates for the John Spencer Blues Explosion, and one of those dates was at a club in Asheville, North Carolina, called the Orange Peel, and I had a few days off of work, and um, I said to Bim, like just casually, I said, "Hey, I might come down and see you guys," because I was big into the Plastic Fang album that John Spencer had out at the time and he said oh yeah sure you will i'll put you on the guest list and we'll see if you show up so i'm always up for a good challenge so i got in my car and i drove to Asheville, north carolina and i walked into the orange peel and he looked at me he's like what are you doing here i was like well you put me on the guest list so i'm here so um on the way back you have to drive by bristol to get back to cleveland from Asheville, and i started seeing signs for um what said the birthplace of country music museum and this is long before a GPS, internet, and all that. So I started following these signs, and the signs led me to the parking lot of a mall. And I was like, oh, okay. So I parked in the mall, and I walked in, and near, next to the escalator was a sign that said, Birthplace of Country Music, down the escalator. So I got on, I went down the escalator, and I walked up to what looked like an abandoned Gap store. <laughs> you know, very brightly lit, and you know. And I walked in and they had some memorabilia and there was a, an older lady who was clearly a, a volunteer working there and um, we chatted a little, little bit and I asked her if there was anything else interesting to see because I love country history and I understood where Bristol stood in, in that history. And so she told me about some monuments and markers and some murals downtown so I, I drove downtown. And when I left, she looked at me and she said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Cleveland. And she said, Cleveland, Tennessee? And I said, no, Cleveland, Ohio. And she looked at me and she goes, I thought you talked kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I drove to downtown Bristol and um, I, I fell in love. And um, so when me and Bonnie got together, I started dragging her down here. <laughs> and um, one day she was spotted this building, which is a very unique building, um, it's three floors. It's about 4,000 square feet total between the three floors. And she, and it had a really bad, uh, rehab job on the bottom. They had messed up the original storefront and she stopped and she took some pictures of it. And two years later, we came back to Bristol thinking we might be interested in buying a building somewhere here. And, uh, we, we hooked up with a local real estate agent and, um, she drove us around for two days and there was nothing and everything was too expensive, too much work needed. And on the last day, we drove by this building that Bonnie had photographed two years ago, and there was a for sale sign on it. And I was in the back seat of the car, and I started beating the real estate agent on the shoulders, and I was like, pull over, pull over. And we called the guy. He said he had just hung the sign two days before, and um, we made an offer on the building. And um, you know, a month later, it was ours, and that started a year-long process of gutting the first two floors and creating the, the studio space that's now the Ernest Tube. And how, how long ago was that 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 had occurred? It'll be five years ago this July. Oh, well, good thing it was <laughs> kind of before yeah. Zillow blew up, you know? You really got oh. that, that lead of, <laughs> of being on the ground there in Bristol, <laughs> so... Well, yeah, and Bristol see, has seen, a, uh, you know, a resurgence in its, in its downtown. It's a very cool little, uh, you know, uh, small town, downtown... But um, there's not a lot of new construction in Bristol because all the real estate is pretty much taken up already. So this idea of loft living in the downtown area has become very big down here. And um, yeah, the prices of buildings has skyrocketed. And so we feel very fortunate and lucky to have found it when we did. 
Do you have any plans for the future? I know um, with COVID, we couldn't like really do a whole lot as far as gathering together, but it maybe like even of turning your space into more of a, an audience experience kind of uh, setting or, or maybe moving some of, I don't know if the history of country music hall, uh, mall, mall exhibition is still open, but even moving <laughs> some of that historical stuff uh, to Ernest too, because that is just such a cool thing. Well, actually, uh, you hit on two great points. Um, on the second floor of the Ernest Tube, uh, we built a small performance space to host house concerts. So the idea was that an artist could come to the Ernest Tube, uh, record, and then we could have a house concert where they could raise some money to help pay for their recording session and also introduce the people of Bristol to whoever we might have um, brought down or booked at uh, in, uh, the Response from people in Cleveland has actually been pretty amazing. Um, artists like Rachel Brown have come down. Thor Platter's come down. Charles Hill Jr. Come, has come down. Uh, our friend Dan McCoy has come down. So, um, yeah, it's uh, adding that experience. And then with COVID, like you said, we started doing a lot of live streaming. Um, and Dave has run all of the live streaming for the last year. And um, that adds this whole other layer that we didn't even realize the potential of at the time. So it, it'll yeah. be something that we use moving forward um, into the future. Um, and going back to the mall basement thing, they raised about $8 million and they built a museum, which we are about 400 steps away from. This building that we bought literally is at their front door. So our goal in the long term is to partner with them on as many things as possible from a historical standpoint. That's mm. so awesome. You ever like yeah. feel like you're at the right place at the right time and like something is just like calling you to do this? Like it just totally sounds like that kind of story, you know? Well, there's been so many serendipitous moments. Um, I, I, it's, sometimes it's hard to process. When I brought Bonnie down one time uh, when we thought we were just starting to look around and think about this idea, um, I booked an Airbnb, and then uh, within walking distance of the Airbnb was a microbrewery that was, of all things, having a wine dinner. And so I thought, well, it's a good thing me and Bonnie can walk to it, have a few drinks, and not worry about having to drive anywhere. And I sat down next to a gentleman named Larry, and uh, Larry asked me – there was only eight people at the wine dinner, so it was obvious we were not from Bristol. And so people were asking us all sorts of questions, and – this guy, Larry, asked me what I did for a living, and when I told him, he, like, flipped his wig, and um, he became, like, he is, like, my best friend down here, and he also sits on the board of the Birthplace of Country Music Museum, and he introduced us to everybody, and, like, just that moment of sitting next to him and talking to him changed the whole trajectory of, like, what we were up to, so it's pretty interesting and you know i dragged dave into all of this <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he might not feel the same way about serendipity like he's <laughs> dave's journey through this has been a lot different because he's not he wasn't connected to country music so although you know, I, he, I do have a much greater appreciation for it now and and knowledge about everything than i did five years ago for sure yeah i mean dave Which gets I, out there yeah. on the he gets out there on the floor i do most of the cutting work and he's the guy out there on the floor with the microphones moving the musicians around like you know i don't you might want to ask dave about that whole process yeah we're gonna yeah, yeah i definitely want to talk about the live uh stream uh, a little bit you know who um who were some of the first ones that you did there what were some of the ones that really stood out out to you as well as um some good stuff for the live streams i think uh what do we start with we started with uh for believe in bristol well, the local organization, they're like a CDC down here called Believe in Bristol. They, had, they do a, a concert series every summer called Border Bash where they set up bands on the street and people come and hang out and patronize the local downtown businesses. And COVID canceled all of that. So Believe in Bristol approached us about uh, hosting all of the bands that they had already booked. And um, for us, it turned out to be a great opportunity to meet a lot of new bands and uh, meet a lot of new people. And um, so... Um, one of the big ones that we did was a band called 49 Winchester, which might not be on the radar screen of people up north, but they are definitely a band that is like on the rise right now down here in Appalachia. They're, uh, you know, uh, they're one of those like kind of hot 
hot bands right now. I'm trying to think who else. Yeah, we've we've had a lot. If, if anybody is interested, they're all archived on our uh, Facebook page, the Ernest Tube Facebook page. And we tried to make it as inclusive as possible. Like, you know, we don't ever want to get pigeonholed into this, like, hey, we're recreating the past um, just for the sake of recreating the past. We always want to try and move things forward a little bit. So we actually even did a series over the summertime where we called it the Night the, the night Tripper series in honor of Dr. Oh, John, yeah. where <laughs> we brought in a bunch of electronic artists and they did their sets of electronic music live from the Ernest Tube also. And I, I had a blast with those and I, I thought those were really uh, productive and fun. We all did peyote. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but Dave, I mean, it was a long time ago too, you did do some work for like Bad Racket Studios. I think oh, that's yeah. when I first yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We met each other. Mm-hmm. So it this does take the, the portion of recording artists and, and doing what you love there and sets it to to vinyl which you also yeah. have just a ton of experience yeah with, so. that if anything was serendipitous it would probably be yeah the recording background combined with the skill set i learned from doing the mastering it definitely gave me great context for you know what to what to do with the artists and and the thing is we also try and mic people minimally when we're when we're doing earnest tube recordings it's it's at a max i think we've used three microphones so usually when we're doing an ensemble of five or six people um, I'll, I'll have to use different miking techniques just to try and capture people. Or, or if there's a lead singer, you know, I can't mix it. I can't go back and post and fix anything. So, so I literally will have a pair of headphones sending me a live signal of the microphone, and I will tell people, you need to move forward, you need to move back, you, you need to move closer to this mic as opposed to this mic, or, you know, whatever have you. And then we actually use a piece of tape <laughs> and, mark, and mark the floor so people don't, you know, if they do need to take a break or use the restroom or anything, they can roughly come back to where they were at, you know, and get the same sound going. Wow. Yeah. That is just such a such a uh, great experience, I'm sure, for, for everybody that's involved. Um, I it, was going to... Yeah, go for it. Oh, I was just going to say, some people get really stressed out and some people, <laughs> some people you know, most people do it with flying colors. Um, but, but usually it's a combo of both <laughs> a little yeah. bit. I wanted to ask you, um, what, you know, have you been able to record any artists this past year? I know you did the live stream for, for, um, uh, the Bristol CDC. Oh, yeah. So, so we do multi-track record all of those. So technically kind of, yeah, <laughs> I haven't done any proper, proper studio recording lately, but I, I have been doing a lot of mastering work for, for digital releases as well and things like that for streaming. Um, yeah. And Ernest Tube has been idle in terms of, you know, when you got to cram people around a microphone. Yeah, it doesn't help really, Doesn't help with, with COVID. Tape. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> COVID's we not doing us any favors. You know, we're not like a traditional, a modern studio where you think of isolation booths and the uh, control room being separate and stuff like that. When I built the studio, um, it has an open floor plan where even the control space is uh, in that room, and that has to do with communication and connection with the artist because, um, you know, as Dave's out there on the floor, like, waving for people to, like, move back from the microphone and and stuff like that, um, you know, we didn't want to have to keep running in the control room, running back out. So now it has this very open uh, feel to it, and um, it lends itself to just having that, like, (laughs) flow with the (laughs) community. That flow with the with that the artist. That was impressive. That was very yeah. impressive. <laughs> um, no, that's that is really that is awesome. I do want to bring up um, another thing that you got that you have on your website um, to listen to on your Bandcamp page is a really cool compilation that you put out about two years ago. It still feels fresh, you know. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, would you like to? to yeah, uh, so I it? I conveniently have a physical copy here. It's like I'm on late night. Uh, <laughs> it is exactly like that. You're yeah. Jimmy Kimmel right now. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so this was a, a collection we did uh, in early 28, or, or no, I'm sorry, early 2016, actually, wasn't it? Well, the election was 2016, so it so probably came out in 2017. 2017, yeah. okay, gotcha. I'm sorry. And yeah, so so we these were actually all recorded here at 78th Street. Um, this was before the studio in Bristol was finished. And we have a, a lot of great Cleveland artists here. Uh, We've got uh, Elizabeth Kelly, who people might recognize from um, 
The Village Bicycle, Ray Flanagan is on here, Lawrence Daniel Caswell, um, Brent Kirby, a whole bunch of R.A. Washington, a whole bunch of Gretchen Ploys. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Sorry, Gretchen, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, So and these are for sale as well. Clint, where can people find these? Uh, that's a real good question right now. I had, uh... <laughs> nowhere. Know, you can find us you, nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, ha I had them on Etsy for a long time, and I think I might have shut down my Etsy account. But, you know, anybody can email us, uh, clint at wellmademusic.net. Um, I would be happy to um, get a copy to anybody that was interested. The idea was we wanted all of these. It's called Analog Rebellion, and we wanted each artist to come in and sing a song that was uh, socially relevant. And it necessarily didn't have to be a protest song, but we just wanted it to have a little something there, uh, social consciousness. And people really delivered. Um, you know, Lawrence Caswell's song is amazing. Liz Kelly's song called The Bra Song is maybe one of my favorite things we've ever recorded. It's pretty and, good. Uh, it's and, so and, catchy. And, and, her, and oh, her session was hilariously short because... She asked, she said, well, do you have a guitar that I could borrow? And this was ahead of time. And we said, yeah, sure, we have a, a guitar. So we had a little Gibson small body guitar. And she walked in and she tuned it up. And we were like kind of sound checking. And then she did the song. And the first take was amazing. Yeah. Like she's got this little laugh in there. And the timing is perfect. And we were like, me and Dave looked at each other. And we're like, uh. And Guess we're, like, we're going oh. home early today. We're like, okay, Liz, uh, we think you're done. And she's like, really? And we're like, yeah. That was awesome. So yeah, it's really uh, it's really at the top of my list of things we've ever recorded at the tube. It's just so spot on. She was perfect. And then uh, Tim Easton too is uh, that was recorded down in Bristol, but that uh, he did a full length record with us called Paco and the Melodic Polaroids. Paco is the name of his guitar um, that he's been traveling with what for thirty plus years now. Since the 80s, I think he yeah, said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. so, so he uh, came down and similarly to uh, Liz, just knocked. He did two marathon days in, in the studio and just, like, knocked them all out. And that's a great album. That's one of my favorite projects that I think we've worked on, if, uh, if anybody has a chance to check that one out. Well, it's actually in the process of being repressed right now. It should be ready in the next month or so. And we're also going to do 25 Wax Mage copies uh, for any of the people who are fans of uh, Wax Mage art pressings. Um, he just got a hold of me and said, hey, uh, do you want anything special? So, um, you know, I gave him a few guidelines and, you know, then Heath and Clifford, you know, go crazy. <laughs> so I can't yeah. wait to see what they come up with for this one. Yeah. And you also have... Uh Eventually, you're going to pro probably start booking sessions there. For pe for musicians who would like to get back into the studio once they're vaccinated and, and you guys are vaccinated, um, where can they go to connect with you about that? And do you, and there is there like a certain type of band that this works really well for? Or I know you were kind of saying earlier, Clint, this is for everybody. You don't have to be a country band or have yeah. an old-timey sound. But... Um, you know, people that you think would like specifically be interested in this. Well, it does definitely have an appeal to, you know, people, you know, our good friends, the Steel City Jug Slammers are a jug band from uh, Birmingham. Uh, Al Birmingham, Alabama. And we have a blast with those guys because they kind of bring like this punk mentality to jug band music. And so uh, we, we've recorded them like three or four times and they're always a blast. Um, but, you know, I would love to see somebody come in and, do some hip hop or some rap or, you know, something that just stretches the boundaries of that format. Um, electronic music I would be interested in. I mean, the, the limitations of every format often supply you with opportunities to create a different sound. And so I think anybody should take advantage of it. Um, I never really envisioned it as a way for somebody to come in and make an entire album that way. Although then Tim Easton came and yeah, blew that right out of the water. <laughs> yeah, that was Be specifically his whole idea. <laughs> because that album really is amazing. I mean, um, I can't say enough good things about that particular record. Like, the writing is great. His playing is awesome. And he was, like, really prepared when he came to do that record. And I always thought it would be a good way to do some singles, um, Charles Hill is, is uh, getting a record label off the ground called Armadillo Tail, and his concept was to bring people in and do uh, uh, some singles. And so we did a Canadian uh, couple, uh, Blake Berglund and his wife, uh, who goes by the name of Belle Plain, came in and they recorded a Jimmy Rogers song and a Carter Family song, and their twist on it was as they flipped the gender 
uh, the Carter family song was done by uh, Blake, and the Jimmy Rogers song was done by uh, Bell. And uh, Charles has that out on his, on his record label, and he's he's looking to, to bring that series uh, back to life after COVID um, uh, kind of wanes a little bit. So um, yeah, no, I, I don't want to put any restrictions on it at all. I think uh, I think it's a, a viable for, way to record. It's this in the moment lightning in a bottle feeling, you know, that if you just re-record and overdub and always try and make everything perfect, sometimes it loses a little heart, you know? So, you know, we want to offer that alternative. Thank you both so, so much for joining us today. I know we went way over what I said. I oh, was no like, worries. I was like, I'm only going to have you here for 30 minutes. Don't even worry about it. So hey sorry. If you made dessert dinner reservations, you might have nah. to call them. <laughs> but, nah, nah, uh, not just, here, no. <laughs> Just thank you both so much for joining me. This is definitely one that I've wanted to have for a oh. while, uh, you guys on the show, to talk about all the good stuff that you're doing. And so it was nice to finally sit down and, and, and get this in. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for having yeah. us. Yeah, I mean, thanks for your interest. We really appreciate uh, Obviously, we could talk about it all day long. Um, yeah. You know, you can go to the, the earnesttube.com is, is uh, where you can uh, check us out. Um, we're active on Instagram. Um, Instagram is really fun for the Ernest tube because it offers so many possibilities for good, you know, photography and stuff like that. So, um, I really suggest people go check out our Instagram page, which is just the Ernest tube. Yeah. And you also have that, the roots of American music, uh, podcasts as well, which sound awesome. Then I haven't seen those yet. I'm going to personally check those out, make a note to myself to look oh, at those. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the third season right now. We got funded to do a thing called the Akron Heritage Music Project. So all the ones we're doing right now are Akron centric. And we um, produced a great episode about the history of uh, jazz music in Akron a while back. And we had a, a great band called the Tommy Lehman Quintet um, who just rocked the house. I think it was a bunch of jazz guys that hadn't been able to get together for a year and they were they were ready. And uh, yeah. so that that's a really good one to watch. Great performance. So cool. Well, thank you guys so, so much. I do appreciate it. I'm going to just give um, our listeners out there a couple last uh, notes for, for us. Next week, we are going to be doing our telethon show. And so we will uh, not be airing this interview with the Ernest Tube until the following week. So uh, just, you know, if you're really excited to hear this on the radio with maybe <laughs> with the music in, involved as well, that you can expect on the 15th of April. But next week on the 8th, it will be our annual telethon. We are raising money right now for WRUW for our uh, annual budget. Helps us stay on the air, do all of the great programming that we have continued to do throughout the pandemic. Isaac, can you cut to yourself for to show your shirt? And I'm also wearing he's my like, W. He's like, oh, no, not, I'm not wearing, really. I'm no, wearing my easily. WRUW shirt. <laughs> but if you go to our website right now, telethon telethon.wrew.org, uh, we have all of our great premiums there, and you can donate to your favorite shows. So thanks so much for joining us, guys. And oh, you got a du- yep. There's Dave's yeah. WRUW sticker. <laughs> and well, wax stuff. and age, right? And yeah. wax and age, yeah. And, we'll yeah. S- Oh, and bad, your bad racket. And we'll yeah, send you, yeah we'll frog send you dogs on there. Frog dogs. <laughs> so cute. Good old um, frog dog. <laughs> so that's what you can expect from us uh, the next couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we will talk to you later tonight on the, on the air. <laughs> Thanks again, Rachel. Th- thank you, Rachel. Thank you, guys. Mm-hmm.